new discovery, an extensive system of waterworks hidden for centuries in the Cambodian landscape. So in this map you can see much more clearly the detail and the sophistication of the water management system. You see dozens and dozens of canals. In fact you can trace the flow of the water through this network uh, from this area here through this very complex system in the middle and then dispersed throughout Angkor to the south. This is great because down on the ground you'd have no idea that any of this exists. Yeah, look, even archaeologists have trouble making sense of this landscape from the ground. Uh, what you really need to do is get up in the air and uh, have a look at things from an aerial perspective. Sounds like a great time for a little airborne reconnaissance. Damien and his colleagues have recently released a major new study. Turns out, Angkor Wat was just a small part of the largest settlement in the pre-industrial world. And arguably, the Khmer's greatest achievement was not their temples, but what they could do with water. So what we can see down here is the West Marai. This is the largest reservoir in the Khmer Empire. and holds about 50 million cubic meters of water. Absolutely massive. How was this created? Did they dam up a certain part of it, or...? Was this all hand dug? A little bit of both, actually. The downslope side was probably a dam originally, and then they formalized it into making it a, a huge rectangular reservoir by mounding up earth all along the sides of it. So this was pure hard labor right here. Absolutely. Just like any task on the landscape here, it's completely flat, so any time you see something like this, it means that they've just poured thousands and thousands of people into remodeling the landscape in that area. I mean, when you think about 16 square kilometers of a reservoir in the 12th century, that's a huge engineering feat. The engineering here is unparalleled. You don't see it really anywhere else in the pre-industrial world on this kind of scale. Turning north, we fly over ancient rice paddies whose boundaries were set a thousand years ago. What we can see crisscrossing the landscape here is an incredible system of water management that really doesn't exist anywhere else in the ancient world on this kind of scale. Is that what this is right here in front of me? Right. This is actually the main feeder line of, of water from the headwaters where the rain falls in the Kulan Mountains to the north and transporting it right down into the central temple district. You know, archaeologists have always known about these huge temples. For at least 100, 150 years they've been well studied. What we've been able to do using remote sensing and using this uh, NASA radar imagery is to really come to terms with the scale and the complexity of this water management system. With Damien's help, I now see the landscape is full of clues to the past. It's amazing to consider the skills of these ancient Angkorians. When I first saw the temple of Angkor Wat, I was blown away. But I literally thought that that was all there is. But now I realize, after being up here in the air, that it's part of a greater civilization that goes on and on as far as the eye can see. It truly is very impressive. From the Kulin Mountains to the temples and rice fields below, this intricate scheme of 1,100 square miles of irrigation and reservoirs gave the Khmer year-round harvests. It made it possible to feed a population of up to a million people and brought its rulers vast wealth. From this perspective, we can clearly see how they mastered their environment and even catch a glimpse of a temple still shrouded in jungle foliage. And how many people have ever been to this temple, you think? Maybe half a dozen people, I think, would have been to this temple on the ground. And this area is littered with things like this. This is one of several hundred temples like this. So right now, we're heading up to the north of Angkor towards the Kulan Mountains, which is the source of the water for the Siem Reap River, which feeds the central temple zone. What you're going to see up here is pretty impressive. Our pilot goes in for a close-up before landing us on top of the mountain. They're still actively clearing mines in these areas? Yeah, they are. It's very heavily mined in this area here. Well, I'll follow you then. Due to its strategic location, this area is riddled with landmines. Cambodia is still emerging from a nightmare. 30 years of war including the genocidal reign of the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s. But a fragile peace is now renewing the hope of the people here and allowing them to once again enjoy their birthright. Damien takes me to a sacred part of the river. Wow, look at this. 
It looks like they've actually carved out the stone of the riverbed here. That's right, yeah. In fact, all of this area here is carved out underneath the water. What are these symbols? Uh, well, the central object there is called a lingam. Uh, it's a phallic symbol, a symbol of male fertile power. Uh, the enclosure around that is called a yoni, which is a representation of female fertile power. Is this meant to give some sort of symbolic power to the water here? That's right. As the water flows over the top, it's uh, imbued with this kind of ritual fertility. Then it flows down from the Kulen out into the rice fields at Angkor down below and sort of delivers that fertile power to the rice fields. Damien tells me that these symbols would have been carved during the dry season when the riverbed is exposed. There are hundreds of these carvings engraved here. So, in a sense, they're blessing the source of the water that feeds their empire. That's exactly right. If I were to climb in and uh, touch the stone or drink from the water, would that give me strength and fertility? Uh, look, I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure it would make you very sick, so you'd need all the help that you could get, I reckon. <laughs> now that I understand the spiritual importance of the water here, I want to get another look at that spectacular waterfall. These are just the smaller ones up yeah. here. It goes down and like the bigger ones are down there. These are the headwaters of the Siem Reap River. It's called the Ganges of Cambodia, and now I know why. Like the Holy River in India, people come here to be renewed in both body and soul. It's not hard to believe it's a little bit of heaven. but you can't appreciate it until you're actually standing right under it. And this is the exact same power that fueled the Khmer Empire. It's absolutely amazing. Damien and I leave the mountain as we arrive by helicopter. Driving back into town, he explains how water and rice were the keys to the Khmer's success. Would they have used the canals for agriculture? Traditionally, people have denied that that's the case. Uh, but increasingly, what our mapping work and what our excavations are showing is that these canals were very tightly integrated into the rice agriculture system here at Angkor. We would have needed a big army to build an empire that was that huge. And rice would be a cheap way to feed them. That's absolutely right. You know, if you manage water very effectively, you can also create huge surpluses and convert that directly into empire building. For centuries, the Khmer managed their water effectively, allowing them to feed their vast population and consolidate their power. They built a strong and wealthy empire, but their bas reliefs reveal another clue to their success. It's Cambodia's secret weapon, the lost and lethal martial art, Bokator. That works. I've come to Northwest Cambodia in an attempt to solve one of the world's great riddles. How could a civilization that built this virtually disappear overnight? Their masterpiece lost to the jungle for over 400 years. Angkor Wat's rediscovery in the 19th century gave evidence once again that history is usually defined by those with the power. The ancient Khmer inscriptions found on many of these temples proclaim the greatness of the kings who built them but they tell us very little about the daily lives of the Khmer people. But it was, after all, the ancient Khmer people who built the rice fields, canals, reservoirs, and temples that distinguished this civilization. And it's their features that are reflected in the faces of Cambodians today. To learn more about the Khmer, past and present, I've come to the old market in downtown Siem Reap. We have the fish, vegetables, and meat, all different kinds of fruit. Kin Po Tai is a cultural expert who grew up in this town. These are on the bar relief of the temple. So this this one is right been, here? Yeah, it's been preserved for thousand years. It's simple, it's just salt it and dry out in the sun. Tai tells me that many things we see around us have changed surprisingly little in the last millennium. And the proof is carved in stone just a few miles down the road. So this is the second largest temple in Angkor, after the Angkor Wat, and it's the Bayon. It's the, one of the most famous temples as well in Angkor. Tai tells me that the Bayon is actually a Buddhist shrine. It was built in the 14th century by a Khmer king who converted to this new faith when it swept through Southeast Asia. 
The Bayan is famous for the more than 200 giant faces atop its 54 stone towers. 